Alright, thanks everyone for coming. My name is Will Kent. I'm a cyber navigator with the Chicago Public Library. I also work with the University of Illinois on a retention initiative for first generation college students. students. And this panel right now will be about the local library serving communities in times of crisis and change. Thanks. So, um, I'd like to introduce the panel to you really briefly before we get started. To my left, to your right, is Rose Peterson of the Rockford Public Library, and next to her is Brooke Benson, Bonson, sorry, excuse me, of the Fremont Public Library, and um, next to her is Kang Chu of the Friends of Rogers Park Library um, of Chicago Public Libraries. So, without further ado, um, I'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves and speak to uh, the theme of the panel. And afterwards, we'll take questions. And the way those will work is, um, since it's uh, since we're broadcasting online, if you guys could ask questions to me, I'll repeat them, and then um, we'll have the panelists field your questions. All right, thanks. Okay, I guess I will go first. My name is Brooke Bonson. I am from the Fremont Public Library, located in Mundelein, Illinois. I'll show you in a minute where that is. I'm a graduate of the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana Library School. And today the topic is, how is the local library serving communities in crisis and change? The library depends on its patrons and the local community and vice versa. What happens to this relationship when communities are under stress or when technologies are in flux. Some of the challenges that our library started out historically access to internet in our community is still low but getting higher. Um, from that challenge has come technology skills. So now people that have access to the internet tend to be low on the skills on how to use the internet or use technology. We also have challenges with language in our community, the economic stress, and some of the technologies that are changing quicker are not really affecting our community library because we seem to handle those changing technologies well right now, and we are not um, a library that is advanced in that sense. So they're not coming in wanting to know what is the, the most hot technology now. They're not asking those types of questions. So that challenge tends to be something that may happen down the line, but right now we're doing okay. Some of our successes, we have more people on, online. Our computer labs are full every day. Our technology classes are full. We have bilingual staff. And we have made partnerships with local business organizations in order to meet those stresses of the economic challenges. The Fremont Public Library District is, this is all of Lake County, so if you look at the bottom is where Cook County is, so we're the county right above Cook County. And the district covers, I think, about seven different villages. Every district in Lake County is a little bit different of the library district. Our 2010 census population was 37,468. And you'll see later, if you see the square and then directly east of the square, there are some jagged lines. The charts I'll show later are mostly of Fremont Township, which covers the square, and then a part of Libertyville Township that is the jagged lines to the east. So in Fremont Township, we have 28,000 people. Our 2010 five-year estimate, out of 28,000, 20,000 speak only English. After that, I took the top six languages other than English, and you'll see that Spanish is the highest, followed by Russian, Polish, Chinese, Korean, and Tagalog. And if you look at the neighboring district, Libertyville Township, which is much bigger than our township, but includes that little jagged area, out of 49,000, 36,000 only speak English. The top six still Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Korean, Polish, and Serbo-Croatian. So we do have a diverse amount of languages in our district. 
And recently I was awarded the Village of Mundelein's 2012 Diversity Award by the Human Relations Commission. The award was based on extraordinary efforts to promote diversity in the community. The following slides are some of the activities that I've done at the library, which the assistant director nominated me for the award. The bottom picture is a staged photo of one of my <laughs> top students. <laughs> and we, she came to the library about two and a half years ago. She comes every Tuesday and Thursday for ESL classes. Um, she works at Jewel, so I see her at, at the grocery store also. And she wanted to learn how to use the internet. We started with no skills at all. We went from learning the mouse, difference between left click and right click, all the way up to Yahoo Mail, which she got and has their own email, and she could get on by herself after about two hours. So that was the first lesson. Um, up until about a week ago, she said, I want to learn how to search for plane tickets so I can fly back to Mexico. So we went online and did a bunch of searching on how to find the best deals. So she's come a long way. She can now do that all by herself and started out at our library um, with me in Spanish. And here are some of the bilingual services at Fremont. I did learn Spanish as a second language in high school and through uh, college. So that has actually helped me at my present job right now. Um, this is a flyer from one of our technology help that for about two years was constantly every Tuesday. Then we added Wednesday mornings. We have a high percentage of seniors in our district, too, who sometimes don't like to drive at night. And on Tuesdays, you could see that there is a Spanish phrase, which I would be there to help. Right now, we have moved to a lot more. Wednesdays, every Wednesday, 1 to 2.30 p.m. And then Monday through Thursday, we now make appointments, 5.30, 6.30, and 7.30. Now the interesting thing is this flyer has no mention of Spanish help, but I'm the person there on Wednesday and somehow word has traveled. <laughs> so I have been busy every Wednesday, 5.30, 6.30, and 7.30 since we started in probably January. And sometimes I have repeat customers. I've had a man who worked for a local park district who um, had a suspicion of corruption and wanted to kind of research and make sure their nonprofit status was really nonprofit and that people weren't taking money and he had very limited computer skills. So we went through that all in Spanish. Um, I had someone taking the citizenship test who wanted to hear the English question. She passed the written question, but when she listened to the interview question, and they asked her questions in English, she just said no to everything without really thinking about what they were saying. So we found YouTube videos where she sat down and just practiced listening to each question. She went back the second time and passed, so that was amazing. Um, we've had parents come in with their kids wanting to find school lunch menus that are only online now. So they don't send home what their kids are having for lunch, they have to download them online. So there's lots of things going on. Once again, that's in Spanish. We tried to do a computer class with myself as an assistant. And I don't know if it turned people away because it was in English, but very few Spanish speakers showed up. We had about nine registered and two came. So we're still slowly trying to get our community to show up for classes and especially trying to offer either in English or bilingually and seeing what works the best in that sense. So those were some of our classes we offered. And the following slides are a lot of our family programming that we do at the library. The, this is a part of our newsletter which is published in both languages because once again, even though the program's in Spanish, anyone's welcome, so we always publish in English also. Um, the Cuéntame un Cuento was a story time for families, and I've heard before I arrived at the library they had been trying many different times, many different schedules to, to try and serve the Spanish-speaking community, and no one was showing up. Um, I think I started with four kids, and by the end was up to 25. So it's very popular now. 
Uh, we had Curious George come. That was the Quenta May flyer. Um, the Quenta May has morphed into a craft time now with Arte Baile y Cuentos, and we do songs, dance, and crafts. And the kids seem to love that. That might be why we have more kids coming, because there's a craft involved. But that, once again, is all in Spanish. We have a lot of parents also who are trying to keep Spanish in their home. So maybe they've come to the US and they've only spoken English for a long time, and now they want to teach their kids Spanish again. So they come to Arte Baile when those trying to reteach their children their native language. We have a National Gaming Day, and I thought this was a great picture because they're playing Picture Rica, which is wordless. So, well, you do read words on cards, but we have some Spanish-speaking kids with English-speaking kids playing together, and it's a picture game, so all you really have to do is know what to look for. That was popular. A Dia de los Muertos craft, where we um, decorated skull cookies. And once again, our Curious George presentation was a lot of fun because we took a book, made it into a PowerPoint, and then read in both English and Spanish in front of a crowd of 135 people. And actually, pretty much half and half Spanish-speaking, half English-speaking, so everyone <coughs> could understand. While I was working on this PowerPoint at the reference desk, I overheard a mother and a daughter reading Curious George in Spanish, so I thought that was kind of neat. They sat there for about 15 minutes reading the book out loud. Um, we had a Spanish Hispanic Heritage Month book club. You could read a bilingual book. That way, if it's written in English and you don't read Spanish, that's fine. And they were entered to, to win a prize. And the following slides are a little bit of our Spanish collection. Okay. We have books, DVDs, CDs, both in juvenile and adult. Some of our new fiction and nonfiction for adult and the um, Office for Dummies book, that's what it looks like in Spain. So we, had, we were able to go to Spain and two years ago to Guadalajara to purchase Spanish materials, which is a great program if you can look into that in your library, collect Spanish materials. ALA will will sponsor you, and Spain was completely sponsored by the government, so that was nice. So those are on display. Um, some of our children, DVDs to the left, and our adult nonfiction to the right, GED books, always important also in Spanish. We recently were able to purchase the Spanish language part of our catalog, which is slowly being rolled out. This, um, you have a choice on the very top left, which is really hard to see. We'll probably be changing that. And I've had three phone calls only with people saying, I'm trying to log in and I can't log in, and it's all in Spanish. So I know at least three people are using it. <laughs> I hope more people are, and we haven't looked at those statistics yet, but it's, it's much easier for me to read the words on the page in Spanish than to translate in my head. And if they're reading English, it's hard for them to say, how do I log in? Because these terms are confusing anyway. So um, we walked through that. By the end of the conversation, one woman said, oh, I also heard you have GED online. Can you walk me through that too? So I was able to do that in Spanish. We have an ESL tutorial online. Unfortunately, the Learning English is only presentable in Spanish. My hope is that we can have ESL presented in all languages, and we're looking into purchasing a different database soon. And our Learning Express library, which this is the GED study page, all in Spanish, also available in English. Um, about a year ago, we had a grant to celebrate all cultures, so we decided to kind of expand away from just focusing on Spanish and had a samba program, a Japanese drumming program, and an African uh, dance and storytelling program. So we did a Map Your Heritage Reading Club tour. We celebrated all heritage from all of our patrons. 
And then we branched out and did a destination in China and had one of our um, paid employees, one of our shelvers, come in and teach one counting one to ten in Chinese and head, shoulders, knees, and toes in Chinese. And then Russia, one of our tech, tech services catalogers, speaks Russian. So she came in and did the same thing. Had children. They're not children's librarians, so you don't want to ask them to do too much, but counting to ten and head, shoulders, knees, and toes um, was okay for both of them. So hopefully as our community, as we hire more uh, diverse staff that speak languages, we can offer more programs like these. The, I took a picture of some of our circulation staff, and I just did a quick interview. Stacy in the front speaks Spanish, and I said, how many people come up to you and just start speaking Spanish? She said, one in five. Every day she's there. And I don't know if they, they're directed towards her because she does speak Spanish. Lily in the back speaks Chinese, and she said, actually, they don't usually ask her um, to speak. Well, they'll usually say, where are you from? When she says China, then they'll start speaking Chinese together, but they'll start in English, which I thought was a difference. Um, but that was just a quick survey. So it's very helpful to have our bilingual circulation staff, too, because that is where some problems are with fines and books overdue. And some of our other services were host for ESL classes. We may start citizenship classes soon. We are starting to do retirement center outreach, especially for e-readers, because our senior population, just that's a huge part of the e-reader community right now. Um, we're represented at different community organizations, and we coordinate with the Jump Start programs in our community, which are at-risk at youth, pre-kindergarten kids. They come into our, our library about twice a year, and we work closely with them. The hopes for the future are more language representation at our library, as in um, bilingual staff, bilingual programs for all languages, not just Spanish. And we're starting a collection slowly. We may start with the periodicals, the popular periodicals in different languages. I would love to off offer Spanish computer classes and hope for consistent attendance. The one-on-one -on -one seems to work really well, but then when you have three people back to back, it would make more sense to just have them in front of you in a class. So having, um, getting people to arrive and be consistent is one of my hopes. Uh, also to advance our community's technology skills and to just continue the conversation with patrons or outreach to those who may not use the library is one of my hopes. And that's it. Part of the activities of the Friends of the Rogers Park Library has been based on two themes. 
We started out with a library that had its book collection deteriorate over over a period of, of several years, and we instituted Project 20,000. All it was is simply to have people donate books to the library, and we would put those books in circulation that were usable, and the rest were put in book sales, and money was plowed back into buying new books for the library. Uh, we were down to about 39,000 books in about uh, 1987. We brought it back up to 65,000, which was the initial, the initial number of volumes that we had in uh, uh, 1993. The second theme that we started out was lowering the barriers to learning. The, and, and as I think you know from all, all the experience of all the librarians here, that, is that uh, when the school lets out and the library gets populated with kids, they always come to the library. Uh, and they're always not asking the question of, how do I find this book? How do I, how do I uh, find this magazine article? They're asking questions like, how do I write this, uh, how do I write this essay? Or how do I solve this algebra problem? Or how do I work out this uh, chemistry problem? And uh, that led us to put in the Homer Center, which we've got volunteer tutors, to help out the students in the library with those kind of questions. And uh, we don't know how well we're, we're doing there, but, uh, but I was told by the staff librarian, every time September rolls around, the kids will always ask, where are the tutors? So I think we were effective there. Um, I think, I. I want to end my end my uh, story here with three little stories. Uh, one involves one of the most desperate operations after War II. The U.S. Army launched Operation Paperclip, and that was to search out and find the German rocket scientists that built the V-2 rockets. Eventually, called the Werner von Braun. And during his interrogation, they asked him, where did you get these ideas for, for, the, for the V2? And he said, I found it in the public library, by a book by Robert Goddard, Amazon B. American, and that the U.S. Army triples the war at the beginning of World War II. Um, second story is to show the wisdom of corporations. In 1956, um, the invention of transistor by the way, which was invented by one of the uh, physicists at the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana, uh, came, came up, was owned by RCA. And they couldn't figure out how to make money with the transistor. So they sold it to a, a blue Japanese corporation called Sony. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have, we have here an, an Ameri uh, American ideas being exported, not being used by 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 um, by us. The third story I want to end with is, and this should be a book textbook for all librarians, has to be Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And in that book, he tells a story about when he was eight years old, and he was wondering what were the lights in the sky when he looked up from his, from his uh, home in Brooklyn. And he would ask the adults there, the adults would say, hey, there are lights in the sky, kid. What, do you want? what else do you want to know? Uh, so he finally got a library card. He went up to the library and asked for a book about stars. The first book that the library gave him was a book about Clark Gable, um, <laughs> <laughs> Alan Ladd, all those, all those movie stars. Said, no, 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 this is not the book I want. The librarian turned to him and smiled and gave him the right book. When he opened it up in the library, he found out that stars were suns that were very far away. From that moment, his universe enlarged. And what we need to do is to carry that message about what libraries can do. And this is to transform lives, provide the knowledge 
and information that's needed to make a difference. And I am now in it there. Thank you. <laughs> And we serve a population of approximately 150,000. Oh, by the way, I don't have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Sorry about that. I left my little um, micro projector. Um, and we also, we serve a very diverse community. And we have a lot of people, or I should say some of our staff that do speak uh, fluent Spanish. And that, of course, helps quite a bit so that when customers come up to the front desk, you know, they, the first thing they ask is, do you have somebody who speaks Spanish? Um, and of course we do. Um, so, and so the question is, how is the local library serving with communities in crisis and change? And the library depends on its patrons and the local community and vice versa. What happens to this relationship when communities are under stress? and when technologies are in flux. Well, um, we've, like I mentioned, we've had a little bit of uh, turbulent uh, articles that have um, appeared in our uh, local register star, record register star. But aside from that, let me start with, our unemployment rate, like many other cities in, in the United States, have been fairly high. And so what I've been doing now, what's changed a little bit, is how I purchase the databases is a little bit different because now I'm looking for um, databases that are a little bit more geared towards, you know, finding a job, uh, you know, increasing your skill set or skill levels. And um, so they're more career oriented. And so that has changed. Whereas before we were more concerned about the educational, you know, uh, you know, the literature and all of those uh, types of databases. And um, so we're providing a lot of career-oriented help at the reference desk, and uh, a lot of our customers are asking for these, for these resources. And uh, also, we also have incorporated some other, some higher tech-level classes. Because we do have, you know, typically a library, of course, offers the Microsoft Office Suite, you know, the introductory classes and things like that, and maybe the, the intermediate. But we've gone a little step further, and we've started offering QuickBooks and things like that that are more geared towards careers. And how we did this was we uh, received a grant um, from the federal government, and they gave us enough money to purchase some computers, laptops and we took those laptops and we installed QuickBooks and we sent one of our uh, staff persons to go um, get some training for this QuickBooks and QuickBooks is uh, an accounting package and so that was really helpful because we were really curious about some of the people that did get jobs as a result of this and and you know there were a few people that did get jobs but the point is is that we increased their skill level and some, they, we gave them something that they didn't have before. And so that was, that was really great. I was, I was really happy that we were able to do that. And um, let's see. And so now I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about our technologies, okay? So we've, of course, by now gotten rid of all of our VCR tapes, <laughs> old technologies. Uh, we still... We still actually have some video, uh, some uh, video cassettes, you know, that go in those old blue boxes. We still have some of those, um, but we've pretty much replaced them with CD-ROM and MP3 players. And I'm not sure if everybody here is familiar with the Playaways. Um, 
there. Just uh, you have the title um, pre-installed on this little MP3 player, and the customer just attaches the headsets and listens to them, just like you would in a DVD or a CD player. Um, we also have this other uh, device. It's called the Playaway View, and I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with the Playaway View. But essentially what it is, is it's, it's pretty cool. The kids love it. It's, it's just a little screen. And it looks like a little, you know, like if you have a smartphone, you know, you watch videos on it. Well, that's pretty much what it is. And that, too, is pre-installed. And it comes with maybe Elmo, you know, several different stories, maybe seven to ten stories on that little device. And it keeps the children very entertained while mom is grocery shopping. So they're really happy about that. So we have made some changes in terms of our technology. Um, we did not have big complaints, actually, about the Playboy views, considering that they cost $99 to $119 per, uh, per device. And so they are quite expensive. They're also educational. They're not just entertainment, but they're also educational. There's some uh, for children that are you know, up to the age of 12, it talks about the human body, circulatory system, and things like that, as well as uh, literature and children's literature. So they're pretty, uh, pretty well received by the, the customers. The only problem that they have with that is that they're, you know, we put in a big bold print. This, you know, if you lose this, it's $99, so please <laughs> be careful, especially your children. Um, the other thing that's been changing at our library is our computers. Of course, we've gone from upgrading from Windows XP to now Windows 7, and now we're experimenting with uh, Windows tablets in the young adult area, and we're getting feedback from them to find out, okay, what do you find difficult? What is easy for you to, you know, to work with? Can you do your homework on this, or are you too busy playing video games on it? So. Yeah, we just started introducing them in January, uh, February, and so uh, I'm waiting for some results, for some feedback from the teams. And the other thing that we are, will introduce are the e-readers. We will be checking out e-readers. We have to start out with, and we're, okay, let me start from the beginning. What we did was, um, back in November, we knew we were going to be circulating these. And so what I did was I said, okay, we need, to, we need to train our staff because it's very difficult when the customer calls and the staff can't help that person and they have to transfer the call down to IT. So what, what we did was I started out training the staff and I actually started them from step one. We, we showed them how to install the Adobe Digital Editions. And we had a software package on there called Deep Freeze. And the Deep Freeze is actually a piece of software that a lot of different libraries use, and it's used uh, to prevent any changes, uh, permanent changes on the computer. So if you know somebody somehow manages to hack into the computer and they get into the group policy or what have you, uh, when that computer, or if a virus, is, a virus uh, comes onto that computer, that when that computer is rebooted, that change is gone. So. We uh, stepped them through installing the Adobe Digital Editions, which was uh, one of the requirements for uh, some of the particular types of formats for the e-readers. We also showed them, so I brought in a variety of e-readers, so they were exposed to different things, and they were, they were given the choice. Which one do you want? Do you want the Kindle? Do you want the Nook? You know, we explained to them the differences between, and everybody seemed to uh, want the Sony reader, which is one of the easiest uh, readers because uh, Sony has managed to create a very nice uh, e-reader. It's called Sony KRS-T1. And that is another one that we're going to circulate. We're going to start out with the Kindle, uh, Kindle Touch at first. We'll start circulating about 30 of them. And then we'll move on in phases to the Sony e-reader. And the Sony e-reader actually has a built-in app for uh, downloading the books direct to the device, which is a beautiful thing. Because when you have to attach a, um, a device to a computer, you know, and then you have the, all these little variables in there, like is the software working, or is it, you know, if you have any problems, 
where do you look first? Do you look at the e-reader or do you look at the software? And so, um, like I said, the Sony uh, seemed to be the easiest device. We're going to start circulating the Kindle Touches, though, first. And I'm sure everybody here has heard about the Penguin issue, so uh, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for us because uh, we don't have any uh, computer set up for the customer to be able to change the uh, the username. So I'm not sure if everybody here is familiar with the Adobe Digital Editions, but that's another topic in and of itself. So um, yeah, so what's happening right now is that we are going to be circulating these devices very soon. And when I say fairly soon, uh, we had to first, we had to develop the policy. How are we going to circulate these? Do we want teens to be able to get a hold of these? Or should, we just, should they just be adult cards? Well, an adult card is considered um, an individual who was age 14 and above. So um, children, uh, young adults, will be able to check these out. And um, so there was some, a little bit of question about that, but if we let them check out the playaways, why not let them check out the e-readers? What's the difference? They, about, they cost about the same amount, so. Um, okay, and then, so we came up with the policies, and like I said, we'll be circulating them probably around the end of April, and we're going to do a soft launch, and from there, we're just going to go ahead and uh, implement the Sony readers. So we'll have two different ones. Initially, the Kindle Touch and then the Sony readers. And the other thing that I was really excited about was um, I was selected to participate in the joint conference of librarians of color. And the uh, title of it, of what we called our uh, discussion, our panel discussion was Got Digital. And so what we're doing with this is we're going out to the community. We're going out to communities and uh, our community and, uh, you know, for the underserved and also the different churches. And we're showing them how to use these devices, the e-readers. And we've gotten a lot of calls from customers asking when will we be offering these classes. And we have started offering them at the library. And so it's a walk-in type uh, situation, and we always have people walking in wanting to know how to use their device. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, I'll open up the floor to any questions. And if you guys have questions, there's a mic right here. You can come up, or if you're far away, you can shut it up or repeat it to everybody. So does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a question is for Rose. Uh, I was really uh, surprised. Thirty e-readers. Yes. That sounds a lot. So that's really impressive. I just wanted to know what were some of the the lending policies with those, uh, the time they can have it out. They actually need to take it home, right? Uh, how long they can have it and things like that. We're circulating these just like a book, so they get to check it out for three weeks, which means. Um, which is kind of interesting. We're trying to, in the future, match. In Overdrive, they have two weeks to check out a book. So we're going to soon match that so that when they're checking out an e-reader, they can have the book for three weeks as opposed to two weeks. And there's, there's so many things in the policy. We actually had our attorney write something up. And he said, I would prefer that people sign a disclaimer as opposed to, you know, you just give it to them. But the circulation staff uh, just felt that it was too much work. So, but yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually a part of this whole package. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Chu, I had a question for you. Uh, in 2002, we wrote an article. Uh, and uh, in it, you say that as people become involved with the library, they become partners with the institution. As partners, they become the best advocates for the library. And uh, I was just wondering if you could speak more to that point on what that means, that the community becomes advocates. And 
biggest mechanics. Just uh, in terms of from my experience, it, it, yeah, I was one of many thousands that used the Rogers Park Library. Uh, that library has been well used. Uh, it offered classes for uh, English as a second language for many uh, students. It uh, offered GED classes for students that dropped out. And, and, and that is, the, and we have others that just come in to use the library for, uh, to read. And that is the basis for making uh, a message. And all, with all due respect to Marsha McLuhan, the medium is not the message, the message is the message. <laughs> we have to get the message out to the people who use the library to make sure that their voice, they, they speak out and their voices are heard. Uh, and we try to do that in many ways. And we just launched a, uh, an experiment last Saturday in which we invited participants uh, to make a video. And we, got, we were able to get two videos and another amount posted on YouTube. And they're speaking to recent library budget cuts. We have to find ways to uh, let people articulate their dissatisfaction with what happened to the hours that we got cut last year. We have to find ways to get that message across to those who are in charge and make sure that they fund the library adequately. If we fail to do that, if we don't make the library a core institution of civil society, then we could face the same situation that Carl Sagan wrote in Cosmos when the Library of Alexandria was, was sacked and burned. That we would administer a self frontal autonomy on our, on our society. We got to get and hammer this message out in many ways as we can and have as many people speak to that as they can. Uh, and, and we, and the Chicago Public Library, has many thousands, millions of visits every year. And that is the basis for a political force to make a statement about the value of libraries.
I, I can't emphasize this strongly enough, that it has to be marketed. It has to be presented to the uh, citizenry of, of, of the city and make sure that they respond back and say, we need a library. I just thought of the story of the same man who, who wanted to research corruption. Um, I think just listening also, he told me that he lives in a household where his wife and I think three of his daughters don't vote for religious reasons, and I wasn't sure why, but then he said, so I want to vote for seven people in my house. <laughs> he said, so I really need to be able to vote because um, because they're not going to. So I have to kind of take a poll in the house and then I'm the one that goes and, and says what we all think should be happening. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. So just to kind of listen and give, he, he was wondering where he sh should go to vote. So we look at that up online, trying to figure out where you need to go and um, just providing the access to information. Do you need to find information about your local um, people in government, let's let's go do it and use that information for what what you think is just. So I think that's another thing um, by just listening and being able to, and, and especially with the language barrier, is sometimes I literally sit there and translate sites in English so that, or sites that are only presented in English so that they can understand what they're reading and, um, uh, and then teach them Google Translate. Like all you have to do is copy and paste, and then you can, you know, learn a whole thing, a whole new website, all on your own. So, eventually down the road, I hope that the people that come into the library will teach others too. And I hope that just keeps going. That they'll say, "Did you vote? If not, why? Why don't you go to your library to find out and keep furthering um, that information?" <coughs> messages that I gave to my students who are here today is the importance of coming here and thinking about how you can adopt the model of a gathering like East Chicago as you become a library professional because I think that part of the way libraries do the, the, the thing we're being asked of us is by providing forums so that there could be community dialogues and therefore community cohesion before crises start, before there's a proposal to cut branches or before there's budget changes and um, one of the other ways that libraries help, and this has certainly been true for the last um, for 40, 50 years, but in different ways in different decades, is by providing that kind of information people need for their daily lives, the basic information, and actually from the part of the country where our new CPL director is from, they actually not only have a social worker working in the library to help people with these urgent basic, the basic, help me with that. <laughs> Basic needs. But along with that, they have put staff doing information referral in the bathrooms. And I learned this from a student who's probably here, wave your hand if you're in the room, um, this semester. They actually put some staff in the bathrooms to answer questions for people who are hard up and unfamiliar enough with the library service and they don't understand. You can ask any question in the world. So I saw a picture of this, so I know what happens is referral service in the bathrooms of the library. And um, I want to ask you all um, what your experience is of people coming to your libraries and needing that kind of social service information, that information to keep their lives together, um, and how your library addresses those problems. And for that matter, what do you think about bathroom reference? <laughs> Well, I've never heard of bathroom reference. Very interesting concept. Um, I know that when the customers come up to the reference desk and they are asked questions, um, a lot of them will uh, give or refer them to different agencies or whatever else their needs are. And in some cases, you know, it may be that the service uh, that they need is there at the library, and so they will give them brochures, etc. We have uh, brochures that are written in both English and Spanish, so that speaks to our Spanish-speaking community. 
we also have, um, sometimes we bend the rules in certain situations. We have a patient who is in temporary housing um, because he lost his house, and he's at the library every day searching for jobs, and typically you can't even get a library card without a permanent home address. So our, our circulation staff works very well with people who um, are not getting those basic needs met. And he said, I just need a library card to be on the computer to look for a job. And he walks to the library. We're not on a public transportation route, which is unfortunate. Um, so that's an instance when we kind of work with the community. Also, um, I'm just thinking of financial. If, if they're truly had no idea that their 10 DVDs acquire a dollar fine and they're 10 days late, they will also work with people to cut those fines in half or kind of understand that you have to return things um, next time. But we do have a lot and a lot of job applicants that do not have an email address. And just getting that email address sometimes takes up to an hour to try and get that through. And then you have to teach them to remember. I'm sure the cyber, cyber navigators see this a lot. You have to remember the password because the job update will send you email weeks down the road. And so I have another guy that comes in all the time and you know, he said, I applied to Six Flags. That's about 10 minutes from him. I applied to Six Flags months ago and I haven't heard anything from him. Well, did you remember your username and password? No, okay, we have to start all over. So um, I think providing those job services too, and it's, it's difficult that they can't just walk in and fill out a paper application anymore. And then there's nowhere else to go but the public library. And then you have to have a library card and you have to have a permanent address to get a library card. So. Um, trying to keep those barriers open and bending the rules when, when we need to is something that we're okay with. For security reasons, uh, the bathrooms are locked in the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all the shop. And I guess, I guess uh, and to get in, you have to ask the librarian to buzz you in. And I guess that's a basic reference question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it, what what the uh, what a community do can do is to assist librarians and, and when they ask for like additional books, uh, money for books um, that the that the regular city budget doesn't provide, we can raise some money for them. If they could, if they need volunteers to work with the Homer Center. We can't get the volunteers to work in a homework center. It's uh, and that's what is needed in many in many locations is to have make sure, make sure the librarians is in touch with the French group or attempt to set up a French group and make sure that they have this vehicle to reach out to the community and say, uh, "I need some help." Uh, can you help me with this or that? Those are the, the those are the basic questions that uh, that the reference library can ask the community, and the community will often respond back in a generous way. I think there's a question in the back first. Hello, I'm Brian from um, I guess the student, and I just want to ask. Um, as far as all your experiences uh, at public libraries, um, what are some of the uh, predictive natures that you can see from, apart from uh, having forms like this or the economic down downturn from what the community needs and how to better serve the community overall? Did you say predictive natures? Or Protective natures. <laughs> um, I, as I mentioned earlier in my uh, presentation, that uh, that the, that the, we did uh, as much as you need a village to raise a child in a library to make money, and and the recent budget cuts that we had amounted to about ten million dollars 
for to that would uh, restore the hours uh, to the uh, 2010 levels. Um, and I guess we need to see if we could rearrange the uh, or create wording that would that would ask critical questions, embarrassing questions to those who are deciding the budgets for libraries. For instance, if it was, uh, if we were talking about $10 million, it turns out that for a cost of uh, paper backlog, for every resident in the city of Chicago, we would be able to restore the hours. And we ask the question, what one book would you buy for, the city, for each person in the city of Chicago? And that's not a trick question. It's, it's a question that's answered by, you can't buy one book for each person in the city of Chicago. You need to buy a whole bunch of books to, uh, for, uh, for the library in the city of Chicago. We need to find ways, rhetorical tools that will, that will present our point of view to, to find medium that will that will get the message across and make sure that the folks uh, in City Hall who are in charge of the budget know how important the library is. That's, uh, I mean, I hear music here on saying that over and over, but that's, that's the, the core message that we need to find ways of communicating. And, and, and one way we need to do is, is reach out to the individuals. There were two brave souls that came up last weekend and I've never met before. They, 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 they were, they were uh, gracious enough to sit down and, and make a, a, each a video to, that's not currently on YouTube. And hopefully we'll be able to link it up to the Chicago Library Coalition website and, and get the message for other branch libraries to, to embark on a project like this. Um, it's, uh, I, maybe, Maybe uh, when you say the, the medium is the message, no, that's not the case. The medium is the, the message is the message, but we need to find the medium to express that message and, that's a, and to express that core value for our community. I just thought something. I guess the, people, um, the people in our community don't tend to know what they're missing until it's gone. And this is a perfect example. Last summer, we had a huge, horrible storm. And some of our residents were without power for a week straight, which is a long time. The library never lost power. So we have a lot of um, at-home business people who now no longer have the internet. <laughs> and they they come into the library, is your Wi-Fi working? Is, you know, do you even have Wi-Fi? They never needed to come into the library before until they lost power, and every outlet was full. People were on the ground with their laptops working, they had their cell phones plugged in. Um, and I think we have a, a casual community survey every November, and this past November, the amount of people that knew what Wi-Fi, or that we offered Wi-Fi, went up, and we all thought that was because of the storm. So just for something as little as you take away the electricity and then they're, they know where it is and now they, they know that the library is hopefully, if decisions down the road affect our funding, they know we were there for them when, when their home offices weren't. <laughs> so that was an interesting phenomenon. Well, what we do is we try to make it very, very easy because we also experience, like many other libraries, um, a $1.2 million cut in our budget in 2010. And as a result, we lost hours and we lost staff. And we do um, make it as easy as possible for our uh, community to donate whenever possible. Um, we have it on our website, you know, donate to the library. and. We try to tell them, you know, what it goes for, and if they want uh, to perhaps donate it for a particular reason, we would be open to that. And so there's a lot of different things that we try to do, um, but we have not yet uh, 
with the exception of a few programs not charged for anything. We had an Anthony Bourdain that was sponsored by our foundation, Rockford Public Library Foundation, and in that in that particular instance, we did charge, and so that is another way that we're trying to you know, adjust to the budget cuts. Yeah, I had a question for Brooke. Um, the flyers that you had looked really interesting, and I was wondering what was the sort of like marketing strategy for getting this out? You mentioned that some of the events were not like, as attended as you'd like. The thing I always think about is I can make an email list and tell people to, you know, through email, but a lot of people probably don't have email. Um, but I do know that there's like SMS service things that you could set up, but have you experimented with that sort of thing? Or just in general, how do you, do you put those flyers on telephone poles or what do you do? <laughs> no, we haven't yet. Um, a lot of those were from our quarterly newsletter, so it comes out every two months and that goes to every resident in our district. And then we have um, pillars in the library where we post things, but that is kind of the problem, is we're only posting to those who come into the library, so it's hard to get people who, who have never visited the library. Um, even for our Japanese drumming and all of our Dia de, de los Niños events last year, we tried to market at schools Preschools, I think we went to restaurants, um, but it's mostly people who already use the library. So that's an interesting um, thing to think about text messaging, and right, not everyone has an email. We just started Facebook in this last year, which we're kind of late on that, but I'm not sure how many people are seeing Facebook events either. So Particularly with the digital training. Right, the computer training, they don't, they're not on line yet. So I think it's word of mouth. What I've noticed is, and sadly, the neighboring district does not have a Spanish speaker that is technology trainer. So a lot of our patrons aren't even necessarily our card holders. Um, so I'm not sure if it's because they're not being served at their home library, but they tend to be either and sometimes I ask, how did you hear? And they, a lot of times it's through the ESL classes. So they will promote for us. Even though we're just a host, they will promote our services. And I think that's where we get a lot of people also. Sometimes I'll go in and just talk to the ESL classes and say, you can come and ask anything at one-on-one -on -one computer help, and then they'll show up, so. Do you know if other libraries have email lists or like SMS lists? Not that I know of in our area. I'm sure Richard to Arlington Heights. Uh huh. Or email us. Um, we do we have a these class in the for email and so we don't have an SMS. We use SMS for our questions, but it's a task from Mark. So they have some SMS for res reference. They're they're a high tech library. About 20 minutes south of us, I think. We used to have a quarterly print uh, magazine that used to go out to our customers and they would be mailed. And that's costing us quite a bit of money. And in, other, in order to cut back on that expenditure, what we did was we used an email blast, plus what we did was we posted on our website, sign up for the digital version of Explorer. But not only does it, it, it actually caters to particular types of patrons. So in other words, if they're just interested in computer classes, it just blasts out all computer classes that are available. Or if, you know, it's a, a parent, you know, looking just for story time and things like that. We have not used SMS yet. Um, we're thinking about it, but uh, just from, oh, and we offered, uh, if they signed up, uh, we offered to put them in a drawing for a free Kindle, so that helped them a lot of the customers. Eric, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Brooke, you mentioned that you have a question for Roberto from uh, with uh, Chicago Public Library, and my question is for Kevin, but then okay for everyone for comments. So 
as a civilian, quote unquote civilian of the library, how how do you frame the pitch, the sales pitch for other patrons to organize a friends of the library? And how do you carry that to other branches that might not have those groups and sure benefit from it? I guess I have to speak a little bit from my personal history. Uh, when 1987, it was the branch librarian, David Clapp, who invited the community to say, hey, uh, we got a facility that's well used by a lot of people, but the air conditioning is not always working, the roof is leaking, uh, what can we do about that? And, and uh, People got together, and I was one of them. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I missed the meeting, and I became the president of the Fulton Library. But, uh, but it's, as I said before, it is the librarian asking a reference question to the community. It's, it, it is asking, saying, do you value the library? And then why do you, you know, why do you come here? What are, what are you using the library for? And and try and get them to answer to you, and do you value it enough to say to City Hall or whoever's designing the budget, put the money in there? We're, ta we're talking. We're talking about pocket change in terms of the city's budget. Uh, it's, it's, and and to put that back in there, you know, and it, it's about what, the cost of getting sun times for five days a week or one week. For each person in the city of Chicago, we, we got to get that message out and, and invite the public, the, 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 the first word in the public libraries, invite the public to, to, to comment on, on the budget. We, you can't leave it to the librarians to say, hey, we need $10 million. And they'll say, what do you need it for? You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's for the it's for the citizenship of a uh, citizenry of, of the city to say it's their responsibility it's their civic obligation to say we need a learning resource it's called Chicago Public Library this is where people come to learn this is where people can find out a whole bunch of things and and. If we are if we are a city that values knowledge and learning, we need to put a full measure of faith in in libraries, and and libraries are um, are are is an affirmation of faith that that we can transform lives in, in, of each individual that lives in the city of Chicago, or for that matter anywhere in the United States. Um, the American Public Library is a very American institution. It, it is. Uh, um, it, I, I, had, I had the occasion to speak in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I had to remind them that it was, the public library was invented in Pennsylvania. It started with Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia. It was built up by Andrew Carnegie in Pittsburgh. Uh, we 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 need to make sure library staff always renew and affirm a faith that, that, the, uh, that, that the library is a corner institution for any community. And that, and, that, uh, and that is, instead of answering the question as a reference library, you need to ask the question to the community. And, and, I'm, and also put faith in the community that they will come back and say, Yes, we need the library, and we use it. I think we have time for one more question. I'm Lauren Schenberg. I'm a Gisla student at UIUC, and um, most of what you guys have talked about is how you have served the communities, especially in the face of budget cuts. Um, but I'm wondering, I know we're almost out of time, but if you could touch on how you have been served by your communities, because um, that comes to mind as a way to draw the community in these challenging times. Well, I thought the 
first of all, what I'm thinking is the community is serving us simply by walking into our doors or using our electronic resources if they don't or cannot come in to the library. Getting a library card helps. You know, I mean, that's the first one. And um, just, you know, using any of our resources because we pay a lot of money for our databases and if they use them, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful thing. So, I also use the library. If I didn't work at the library, I would use the library every day. So um, I think just having that building, that location available, even I'm in, a, I'm in the neighboring district myself where I live. And so being a community member of the neighboring district and an employee of a different district, it's, it's neat to just see the differences. And they both have their their strengths and their weaknesses, um, but also, uh, I guess, also seeing former storytelling moms in the community and having their kids that I had as two-year-olds now, maybe three or four years old, recognizing me and saying, oh, you're the library lady. It's, it's, <laughs> that's kind of neat, just to have um, that uh, relationship with other people in the community and basically we are public servants too and so they reckon they most people thank you for that so sometimes some people challenge that and can be very annoying but, <laughs> um, so that's a benefit too by being a, a public member of the community um. I'm reminded of uh, one speaker that spoke at the Chicago Review Society, and he brought in the, uh, the story from the Bible, in which he talked about the miracles of the loaves and fishes. And he raised the question, is this really a miracle? And, and he said, it probably wasn't a miracle, but it, it shows maybe one more one underlying institution there, which is the community. It was the fact that the bulls and fishes were brought up by someone in the crowd there, and that uh, others started to contribute to the, the food that was built up. It was a community responding to a question. It was, can we have enough food to provide nourishment for, for our community? And that was a community response. And that one, that underlines what, I, that what the speaker called the, the miracle of the community. It's, it's, it's asking us to come together and making sure that we stand up and say we, we, we need these resources and, to, and that uh, and these are resources that are best provided by government, that, that are best by they're, they're public expense, so public libraries are public expense serving the public good. That is something that needs to be said over and over again. Okay, so we have one more quick comment from the voice. Quickly, this is from my experience as a public library director. Do you want to help your public library visit your um, politicians. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. Make an appointment to go visit your local representative and say, I'm worried about what's going on with our libraries. Go to the library budget hearings. Go into the committee meetings, find out when the committee meetings are going to be, and have people, not librarians, but the members of the community in those, community, in those budget hearings show up when the budget is being discussed by the general city council. Be in the audience. Have signs. Be there with children. The best thing to do is bring as many children as you can with. All right? But really, the, the librarians cannot defend their budget because they are viewed as advocating for themselves. Only the public can defend the budget of the library and you have to get the public there. They, the politicians have to know that this matters. 
and petitions are great, and um, online surveys are great, but the best thing is having to look you in the eye and say, no, I'm going to cut your library budget anyway. They won't do that, all right? But it's up, it's up to the public. So if you don't have a citizen's advisory group for your library, if you don't have a branch uh, friends group, get them involved. Make sure that you have those folks that can advocate for you. They're the best. They're the best. Thank you.